One of the fundamental algorithms in computer science and computer graphics is a space partitioning algorithm called quadtrees. And what those algorithms such as quadtrees that we're talking about or KD trees allow you to do is partition space in order to find the position of points quickly. These acceleration structures, for example, are used internally in Houdini or in VEX at some points when you're searching for close points, for example, but they can also use to visualize images or graphics in quite an intriguing way. So how does a quadtree algorithm work? Imagine this two-dimensional plane here, and you have this point somewhere on it. And you now want to divide that space, so it makes it easier to find the region where that point lies in. And the way you do this is you take this area and check if the point is on this area, which it is, of course. And what you do now is you subdivide that area into four smaller areas of equal size. So we end up with something like this. And now you do the same thing again. For each area, you check if the point is in that area. And if it is in that area, you subdivide that area again. So the next step would look something like this. And again, you repeat the algorithm for each of those squares. You check if the point is on that square. And if it is so, you subdivide it. Like so. And again, you end up with something like this. And you stop when you either have created an area that is within a given threshold distance of an individual point, or if you have reached a set maximum number of subdivision steps. So let's build this. Let's start out by dropping down a grid here, dive in there, have it on the ZX plane, and scale it to be, say, 11 by 22. It doesn't really matter, it's just what I decided on. And give it three rows, two columns, so that we have those two squares here to start with. Next, I want to set up some groups that I will need and some attributes. And I could use the group SOPs or uh, the attribute create SOPs, but I tend to use VEX for that because I find it more compact and more straightforward. So I'm going to drop down a primitive wrangle here, wire this in, and in here I just want to create one group, and I'm going to do that with this add group underscore syntax and call the group do, and set it to zero by default. So none of my primitives in here should be in the primitive group do. That's correct. Next, I'm going to create some points that I put on that plane and want to use to subdivide it. And I'm going to use a font here, so to have some text. And let's just say hi. I'll add some transform to rotate and scale this accordingly. And I already tried, so this should be minus 90 and minus 90 degrees. Whoops, maybe 90 here. Yeah, and scale this up a bit bigger. Let's have a look at the points. And they are very irregular here from the point density. So let's add a resample node and resample this to have a bit of a uniform point density. Like so. Back to my plane. What I want to do in here is check for each individual square if there's any point lying on it. And I'm going to do that with a for each loop, which looks like this. Let's wire this up. And it's already set up to take in individual pieces. That means individual primitives here. And when we middle mouse button over this, we can see we have those two primitives in here, which are these two squares. So the for each loop will kind of disassemble this geometry into its individual pieces and process each individual piece separately. We just want to uncheck the piece attribute. And when we go to the output node here, we can check single pass and we can visualize the individual passes. So it's processing primitive zero and primitive one then. Now, the first thing that I want to do in my for each loop, for each individual piece, I want to set its do group that I will be later using to decide if to subdivide a primitive or not. I want to set this do group to zero. And I just realized this wrangle is unnecessary up here. So I'll just put it in the loop here in the for each loop and make sure that each individual incoming primitive is not in the group that's used for subdivision. Now what I'll have to do is check if an incoming point from here lies on one of those primitives. And again, I'm going to do that using a bit of vex with another prim wrangle. Like so, I'm going to wire this incoming points in here. And in order to check if any of those incoming points here lies on one of these primitives, I'm going to use the near point function. And I will look for the nearest point that's within a circle around the center of the primitive. I know it's not 100% accurate, but close enough. And the way I'm going to do this is first, I need to know the size of my individual primitive. So of my individual square here, and I'm going to use a function called get BB box size, which will return the size of the bounding box of a given primitive. So let's create a vector called size and use the get BB box size function here. And as my for each loop is taking care of disassembling my geometry into individual primitives, I will always have one primitive that I'm working on just a single primitive. So 
I will just set the primitive ID to zero because there's only one primitive that we're working on, which has the primitive number zero. So from this vector that's returning my size in X, Y, and Z direction, I need to calculate a radius within I search for a close point. And I'm gonna do that by creating a float called search rat for radius. And I will set this to the bounding boxes X component. So that's size.x. And I will multiply it by 0.5. That means dividing it by two in order to get the radius out of this diameter. Now that I have my search radius, I can call the near point function. And let's store that near point in an integer called PT. And this will be my near point. And I wanna search for the nearest point coming in through this slot here, that's slot one. The position from which I'm searching for the closest point is the center of my primitives, that's just the P. And the maximum distance I wanna search is the search radius that we calculated. And now we just have to check if we found any points that are within that given search radius close to the center of the primitive. So let's drop down an if statement here. And if this integer with a point number is bigger than minus one, we found a point. Because if we didn't find a point, this function here will return minus one. So we just have to check if the integer stored in PT is bigger than minus one. And if that is the case, we will set the group of the primitive to one. So again, let's go over this. What we're doing here is first get the bounding box of the primitive of an individual primitive. Then from that bounding box size, which is a vector, we calculate the search radius. That means the distance from the center to one of those edges here. And we use that radius and the center point of my primitive to look for a close point that's on this primitive. And if we find such a close point, we will set the primitives group that is used for subdivision to one. Next, we have to subdivide the thing. And we're gonna use the classic subdivide node for that. We leave it set to Houdini Catmull Clark, depth is one, but we wanna overwrite the crease weight attribute in order to prevent any distortions and make sure we are always subdividing into straight squares here. Set that to 10 and we wanna limit it to the group do. Let's try that. We can see now we subdivided both primitives here and that is because we found points on both primitives. So that is already really looking promising, but we have to repeat this over and over again. And the way we do that is we take this for each loop and put it in a for loop. So let's move those up a bit and create a for loop. And a for loop in contrast to a for each loop and a for loop in contrast to a for each loop just executes what's within those two sops here a given number of times which you can set up down here. So for example, in this case, we will execute what's within those two blocks 10 times. Let's just set the iterations to one for now and move this up here, this down here and move this whole block in here like so. Okay, let's just rewire this, tidy it up a bit and highlight the output here. We can see now not much happened. That's because we're only running one iteration. So let's increase that and again and again and again and you can see we're slowly subdividing this space here. And this already is a very simple KD tree. Let's save that and try something else. Instead of using this font to generate the points that will be used to subdivide my primitives, let's use this grid here and just increase its resolution by subdividing it a few times. Again, overwrite the crease weight here and let's subdivide it really finely like so. Then use an attribute from map wire this up in here. Let me see that looks a bit strange. Let's go to the image settings and rotate this by 90 degrees and invert its U. So it's up right here. And let's load an image in here. For example, this guy, which is an Austrian painter, which bears the same name as me and use the color to scatter points on this plane here. But first I want to drop down a bit of Vex again to be able to adjust the color in here. And what I want to do is I want to remap my color. So I'm going to use a ramp here. So the color equals this channel ramp and let's call it color remap and I want to use the color itself as an input value. Let's click this here to create a ramp slider down here and on the one hand what I want to do is I want to invert that image. So let's do it like that. Let's switch off the light here so we can see something and then I'm going to feed it into a scatter sop and check density attribute and use the color CD as a density attribute. So I can now scatter points into those areas that are bright and scatter really few points in these areas that are black and use those points as input for my quad tree. Let's see what comes out of this. Takes a while, but you can see we're slowly generating this image here. Let's increase the iteration one step further 
and the for loop and for each loop are not the quickest loops, but it's okay here. Maybe increase the point density that we scatter in there to say 3000 like so. And let's run the quadtree on that again. So this is one way that we can use a quadtree to visualize images or graphics. But there's another really interesting way we can use this technique. And it's very similar to what ancient image compression worked like. So let's have a look at this. And although this technique is a bit more complicated, it yields really interesting results. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to use the color image stored here and transfer that color onto my subdivided primitives and decide if a primitive's color is very close to the average color of pixel underneath that primitive, then I will stop the subdivision. I'll show you what I mean. In order for this to work, I will just delete those two nodes here. And I'm going to delete that font as well. We don't need that anymore. So I'll have my incoming image here. What I need in the beginning is I need to set up my color. So let's drop down a primitive wrangle again and set the primitive's color to a color that is not stored in this image here. And the color that is not stored in this image typically is a negative color. So let's set that color to minus one, minus one, and minus one. And now in here, the primitive wrangle, where I decide if I want to subdivide a given primitive or not, I will need to change that. So let's delete all this. And what I want to do over and over again is I want to find all pixels underneath each individual primitive, calculate their average color, and then check if that average color differs from the color of the primitive. And if it differs too much, I want to subdivide the primitive and update its color. So what I first need is a threshold to decide how closely the primitive's color matches the average pixel color underneath that primitive. Let's do that by creating a float called threshold. And we're going to use a float slider for that. Let's call that color threshold, create it. And in my case, I want to set it to something like 0 0.02. Now here's the thing, in order to check the difference in color, I'm going to use a distance function. And distance functions are computationally expensive, because within a distance function, you have to calculate a square root. And to get around that, there's a quicker function, which returns the square distance. However, to compare a square distance, to my input distance here, I will have to square my input distance as well. So I'm going to do that just by a power function, and I'm going to square that input by two. Next, I will again need the size of my primitive here. So again, I will create a vector called size, I'm going to use the get bb box size function here. And again, it's only one primitive we're working on due to the for each loop. So primitive number zero, next, I'm going to calculate my search radius, which is going to be a float, call it search rat. And it's going to be the x component of my size vector times 0.5. Next, now I want to find all the underlying pixels of that primitive. So all pixels coming in here that are within that search radius from the center of the primitive. So I'm going to use the near points function this time. And that's going to return an integer array. That's why I put these square brackets here. And I want to look for near points that are coming in through the input slot one. I want to look from my primitive center, the maximum distance they should have is the search radius. And let's say I want to look for 10,000 points max, I also want to look for the center pixel that's underneath each primitive. And I can use a fun fact because the shortest point distance found by the near points function will be the first value in this array here. So let's create another variable called center point. And this should be the first point stored in my close points array here. Now I want to look up the color of that center point. Let's call the vector center color. And I'm just going to look it up with the point function coming in through input slot one, I want to look up the color on the center point. Next, what I want to do is average the color of all the points that we found here. So in order to build that average, I first have to initialize a variable. Let's call the average color just average AVG. And I want to initialize this with zeros. Also, I want to initialize a counting variable that counts how many pixels we found. Let's use a float here, call it n, set it to zero as well. Now I need to go through all these points and sum up their individual colors. I'm going to do that with a for each loop. And we're going to use the we're going to go through the point stored in the PTS variable. And we will output those individual points into a variable called PT like so curly brackets. So what this for each loop does is it goes through this whole array here. And with each loop, it pulls out one value out of this array and stores it into this PT variable here. So we first want to extract the color value from the individual points or pixels that we found. So let's create a vector call and extract 
the color with a point function. Again, coming in through input slot one, looking for the color on the point PT, like so. Then let's add this to our average vector. So average equals average plus, which can be written short as this. So this just means average equals average plus color. It's just a shorthand code for that. And with each loop, let's increase our counting variable here. And n plus plus is shorthand for n equals n plus one. So after we stored all these individual pixel colors into the average vector, to average it out, we'll have to divide it by the number of pixels we found. So again, average equals average divided by n, which in short can be written like this. So what we did now is we found all pixels that lie on a given primitive. We calculated those pixels average color, and we also found the color that's on the central pixel. Now what we need to do is we need to check if the primitive's color is close enough to the average color of those pixels underneath it. So let's do that with an if statement. And we want to check if the distance between the color vector average and the color vector of my primitive is below a certain threshold. And we're going to use a distance function for that. And as I already mentioned, a distance function is kind of slow because it has to calculate the square root. So I'm going to use a distance squared function here, which is a bit quicker. So if the distance two, that's distance squared of my color vector of my primitive and my average color vector is above my threshold that I created up here and that I can adjust with the slider here. So if it's above the threshold, then we're going to subdivide this primitive. So let's put it in the group do. And also we want to update this primitive's color. So the new color of the primitive equals the center color that we looked up. And that should be it. Let's give it a try. Fingers crossed. Let's maybe save this first and let's click on this. And that's already looking promising, but just let me go through this one more time quickly and check if I did any mistakes. Okay, I think we're looking good here. The only thing I did is on this subdivision here, I increased the subdivision depth to eight to increase the general resolution of the image. So our color values can be looked up more precisely. And then I set up my repeat end to a iteration count of six. And that's what it spit out. This algorithm is similar or nearly identical to what early image compression did. Because now if you look at this, what you have to do is for those areas here, you can store just a single pixel value for a really large area. While in these areas where it gets detailed, we have to store more pixel values, which will save some space. Just a quick additional remark that I just noticed. In here, I'm setting the new primitive color to the color of the center pixel that's underneath this primitive. And I think in the original algorithm, I do not do that, but I instead set it to the average color which yields only slightly different results, but still, I think that's the more correct way. Of course, as this is more of an artistic use case here, you can decide which algorithm suits your needs better. So that was a really quick intro to generating quatries or a visual representation of quatries. It is not the fastest algorithm out there. I'm totally aware of that. So if you guys have any quicker methods of doing that, I'd be thrilled to hear them. I'd love to hear them. Also, of course, these algorithms can be expanded into three dimensions to build what's called an octree then. And I encourage you to give that a try as well. I think it's a good exercise in VEX and general in Houdini. Again, we're thrilled to see what you guys come up with. And if you'd like to support Antagma, we have this Patreon thing going. And if you're interested in some additional content, you might find some interesting stuff over there. So I hope you had fun and it's cheers and goodbye.